All right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. It's my usual 8.01, so I want to welcome everybody to Grand Rounds today. It's a beautiful January day, and we're finally going to get some snow that's going to stay around for a while, so that's my meteorological um, report. Actually, that isn't my meteorological report. So Sunday, there is a, a blood wolf moon, which is like an extremely rare event. So on Sunday, if, you, if it's clear here, there will be um, a full moon that is one of the closest to Earth. That's what the supermoon is. Uh, it is going to happen before midnight, and it's a total lunar eclipse. They are phenomenal. They're fantastic. Um, if you have any ability to see it and it's clear, they're really, they're amazing. You can see them with the naked eye. So, um, Supermoon means it's close, and um, blood moon means it's red, and the wolf moon means it's happening before midnight. So watch it Sunday night. So with that, we are very honored to have uh, one of our grand round speaker today from outside of the Department of Medicine. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Michael Stewerwald, who is over here in the corner. Great. So he is an assistant professor of medicine in the Department of Emergency Medicine. He is the medical director of UW MedFlight and the director of airway management for MedFlight as well. And I want to just call out in the back corner are some of his peeps, which I think are the med, some MedFlight nurses and physicians. So feel free to, to uh, ask questions at will of your speaker. Um, you know, I always like to give you a little bit of information about who's talking today. So uh, Dr. Stewerwald did his undergraduate degree at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. This was followed by his medical degree also at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. He went on to do his residency at Cincinnati College of Medicine, an emergency medicine residency, and this is uh, in Ohio. And he also then uh, at University of Cincinnati College of Medicine in Cincinnati did a fellowship in EMS medicine. This has been his first faculty job. He joined us here in 2015. He does have some specialty training that really relates to the work he does uh, in the Air Medical Physicians Association, completing an intensive course there. And uh, I always like to uh, mention an award, and so given that he's talking about updates in airway management, he received the Richard Levitan Airway Scholar Award in 2013-2014. And then finally, the thing that he is most proud of in his career up to this point is that he is the medical director uh, for MedFlight, which I think is a great honor. And with that, we are really looking forward to uh, your grand rounds, which is again titled Update in Emergency Airway Management. All right, good morning. Um, very nice to meet you all, and uh, it truly is a, a, an honor and pleasure to be here. So uh, from the bottom of my heart, uh, thank you for the opportunity and thank you for the attention. Um, if at any point in time I say anything that is uh, thought-provoking or interesting to you, please uh, feel free to stop me. Uh, I'm uh, more than willing to take questions as we go uh, and uh, uh, would, uh, frankly, just love the discussion. Um, the talk today is... Uh, the seven P's in 2019. Uh, and if uh, you've never heard the term the seven P's before, uh, don't worry, that's better. Um, that means the talk will be more interesting and more thought provoking for you. Okay, my promise to you is, is that as we talk, I'll talk very little about gizmos. I'm going to talk very little about the actual procedure of laryngoscopy. Hopefully, that's not a deal breaker for you and, uh, and makes you sad that you came. Uh, but we're going to talk about the patient, which is great, because that makes this particular talk translatable across the house of medicine. doesn't matter if you're in emergency medicine, if you're in surgery, if you're in medicine, uh, if you're in whatever specialty, um, these topics should relate. The patient population I want you to think about that may just build a little bit of situational awareness for us is, uh, let's think we're um, at the American Center. Let's think we're here at the VA. Let's think we're in rural community um, hospitals, and we have patients that are either coming into emergency departments or on the floor, and they start to take a turn for the worse, and maybe we decide we need to do some uh, uh, advanced or emergency airway management. Is that cool with everybody? Everybody cool with that context? All right, let's, let's rock and roll. Okay, here's the bottom line. I'm going to talk about something called the hop killer. So um, 
This is a term that was coined by a gentleman named Scott Weingart from New York. Um, it is the ways that people die during laryngoscopy. Okay, so hemodynamic collapse, oxygenation issues, and um, uh, catastrophic uh, uh, pH perturbations. Okay, so think of the hop killers, and yes, it's an ode to beer hops. Okay. All right. So here's the context. So if you're an emergency medicine resident, you know that uh, I have uh, hammered into your brain that an airway plan is a strategy followed by a technique followed by a tool. So what are we going to do to get somebody intubated? We're going to do RSI. Are we going to do DSI? Are we going to do something awake? Are we going to do crash airway management? Are we going to do something else a little bit more uh, specialized? And then after you've picked your strategy, then you focus on a technique, so DL, VL, whatever, and then you focus on a tool. I'm going to whip out the GlideScope device. I'm going to whip out the, uh, the CMAC device. The way that you decide deliberately on a strategy is, is that you um, follow what are uh, referred to as the emergency airway algorithms. This is called the universal uh, emergency airway algorithm. And um, how you apply this is, um, is as so. Okay, so let's say we have that patient. Whatever you decided in your mind is uh, the most pertinent uh, um, to your practice. Okay, so you have that patient. Right? You meet that patient. You do some quick assessment on that patient. Whatever construct you like. Most people like A, B, C, D, E for sick patients. Whatever you like. It's up to you. So the A in that step stands for airway, obviously, but that's airway patency. So that's usually fixed by positioning the patient, doing a good job for us on the patient, um, uh, some simple nasal airway, some simple oral airway. Then you try to figure out what's going on with the patient. Obviously, we've all been there. And then you get to a step where at some point you decide, hmm, this patient needs some emergency airway management. The, uh, the indications that I like to teach are failure to oxygenate, failure to ventilate, failure to protect the airway, or that the anticipated clinical course is going to be improved by intubation. So let's say that that particular patient meets one of those criteria. And then we get to the point where we're going to apply the emergency airway algorithms. Okay? So we'd start up here, and we'd ask, is the patient dead? The patient's dead. The strategy that we pick is called crash airway management. If uh, we are going to do crash airway management, that just means you pull out whatever tool you like and see what you can see. The patient isn't dead, you try to predict difficulty. Uh, we uh, use some prediction mnemonics. Um, everyone is taught a little bit differently uh, depending on what uh, uh, house of, um, what specialty of medicine you come from. Um, if you do predict difficulty, you move on to what uh, we refer to as the difficult airway algorithm. Uh, and if not, uh, RSI is um, the strategy of choice. This is the, uh, the difficult airway algorithm. It's obviously got very little cognitive load associated with it, right? Okay. So what I tend to teach here is just you ask two simple questions. Do you do RSI on somebody? Do you really think you can reoxygenate them easily uh, if uh, they happen to desat during the procedure? And do you really, really, really think you can get the tube in without hubris? All right, without hubris. Um, if at any point in time the patient ends up desaturating uh, uh, critically, you move to what's called the failed airway algorithm. Uh, I think that this is too much cognitive load uh, when Catacols are high, and I don't mean the patient, I mean your catacols are high. You want to keep the, uh, the stress levels low. You want the impact of stress to be mitigated. You want your cognitive load to be as little as possible. So what I simply teach is, if the sats are falling and you can't control it, you bag. If that doesn't work, you bag better, meaning you put uh, four hands into the equation, you put a piece of plastic in somebody's nose, you put a piece of plastic in somebody's mouth, you give the best jaw thrust you possibly can, you position the patient. Almost always that fixes the issues. If that doesn't work, you place a superglottic device, and if that doesn't work, you may be forced to go through the front of the neck. Okay, That's the context. So let's say we've gone through all of that uh, um, decision-making deliberately, and we've uh, decided that we're going to proceed with RSI. So um, RSI, for just uh, uh, any uh, uh, trainees in the room that may be very new, um, RSI is a strategy where you uh, deliver um, a set of interventions, which we'll go through in one second, uh, but you deliver a sedative agent immediately followed by a neuromuscular blocking agent. You wait some period of time, X, and then you move on with your, uh, uh, your laryngoscopy. This is the seven Ps. 
Okay? This is the seven Ps. The seven Ps is the instruction manual for an RSI. Right? Preparation, pre-oxygenation, pre-treatment, paralysis with induction, positioning, placement with proof, and then post-intubation management. Okay? For the last 10 years or so in emergency airway management, um, and I'm, I'm using that term deliberately, okay? so this isn't emergency medicine, this is emergency airway management, which, um, uh, which providers across the spectrum of the house of medicine do. For the last 10 years or so, we've, uh, we've had a little bit of a, um, a, a retreat from original thinking, um, i.e. what I just outlined. And we've had a realization that maybe that's incomplete. Okay? Maybe what we've just discussed is incomplete. Maybe we need to focus more on physiologic difficulty than we need to focus on simply anatomic difficulty. And this has been... Um, uh, this has been uh, uh, now conceptualized uh, in the fifth edition of the Manual of Emergency Airway Management, which sets the standard of care, at least for our specialty, from the fourth edition to the fifth edition. Okay? So these are the seven Ps that we just went through. This is from the fourth edition of that text. This is from the fifth edition of the text. And you'll immediately notice that the third step is replaced with a step called pre-intubation optimization. All right, so that's what I'm here to talk about, pre-intubation optimization. The best review article, because it's the most succinct and to the point, is uh, this one by Jared Mosier and uh, John Sackles from Arizona. Uh, it's uh, published in 2015. If you want a quick read, I mean like 10 minutes, uh, on how to keep patients safer during uh, emergency airway management, this is where you should go. You want a specific um, document uh, to uh, oxygenation difficulties. Uh, this paper by Scott Weingart and Rich Levitan is the place to go. And if you like to learn asynchronously, there's a podcast called the MCRIT podcast, um, which uh, is uh, by that gentleman, Scott Weingart, pretty darn popular in emergency medicine, uh, called the Laryngoscope as a Murder Weapon. Um, uh, the, the series within his podcast is called the Laryngoscope as a Murder Weapon. It's fantastic if you want some teaching on this. Okay, so let's get into it. Let's talk about how we keep our patients safer during emergency airway management. Right? Let's talk about um, how we, we affect some change here. Okay? So let's talk about that first H from the hop killers, hemodynamics. Right? Up to 30% of patients who are critically ill, who you move to do emergency airway management on, um, uh, can have catastrophic uh, hemodynamic collapse. This is a study from the ICU. Uh, where that uh, uh, number comes from. In this study from the emergency department, 23% of patients had hemodynamic collapse after uh, uh, intubation. In this study from the emergency department, 4% of patients had cardiac arrest after emergency airway management. Like, that's real numbers, right? Like, that's, that's something. We know why this happens. It's we monkey with these people's physiology. We take them from negative pressure breathing to positive pressure breathing, and we give them... Uh, uh, agents to facilitate placement of their uh, endotracheal tube that cause um, uh, physiologic perturbations. This is real. This isn't real. This isn't hypothetical. Okay? So you should be afraid when you go to intubate somebody who's critically ill. Everybody in this room, I would assume, has had an experience, myself included, where you have done airway management on someone. Okay? That doesn't mean you did the laryngoscopy, but we've all had patients who have needed advanced airways who have had hemodynamic collapses. It's real, okay? But you shouldn't be afraid, okay? Because there are tools available, there are tools available to help mitigate that risk. And that's what we're here to talk about. The first tool is very simply a concept, and it's resuscitate before you intubate. Um, in the late 80s, early 90s, um, uh, most specifically uh, uh, with respect to cardiac arrest, we had a, uh, a mantra that A first, airway first, and we thought that that was going to help patients save patients. But it also set up a situation where we weren't respecting the fact that people had hemodynamic, um, uh, hemodynamic issues that needed to be corrected before their physiology was um, uh, 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 monkeyed with, for lack of a better term. So if you resuscitate before you intubate, you can drastically affect the margin of safety. 
This is a paper from uh, the intensive care unit where patients either got standard care or a bundle of interventions that affected resuscitation before they were intubated. And they noted a statistically significant difference in both the number of complications uh, and in uh, hemodynamic collapses. Okay. So how do we do this? Let's talk about pragmatic tools. The first is we're going to give volume. Okay. If the patient's bleeding, we give them blood. Okay. That can be pack cells, that can be plasma, that can be whatever. If the patient is dry, we're going to give them crystalloid or whatever is your pleasure. But we're going to give them something. Right? We're going to make sure that we create a margin of safety. Or we're going to give them inopressors. Right? Maybe that's bolus dose inopressors. Maybe that's drip inopressors. We're going to do it before we intubate. We're going to resuscitate before we intubate. Okay? The next tool is we're going to recognize that all sedatives drop blood pressure in shock patients. Right? This is true. There's no such thing as a cardiac stable induction agent. There just isn't when the patient's in shock. Okay? It doesn't matter if you're using the drug ketamine. It doesn't matter if you're using the drug atomidate. If somebody's in shock, giving them a bolus dose of a sedative agent is going to cause a change in their hemodynamics. We've got to recognize this. So what are we going to do about it? In emergency medicine in the maybe mid-2000s, we thought that the answer was, well, we're going to use different agents. We're going to use Atomidate. We're going to use Ketamine. We're going to use whatever we think is going to be less hemodynamically um, uh, uh, active than, uh, for instance, something like the drug Propofol. We were still seeing hemodynamic collapses in shock patients. And why is that? It's because all of these agents cause hemodynamic collapse in shock patients. And the reason why is, is that if you are relying on your endogenous catechols, so the, um, the best example is a 25-year-old who's shot in the abdomen who has a blood pressure of 120 and a heart rate of 150. The reason why is that, that guy has the ability to produce a ton of epi, and he's living based on it. So even if you're de delivering the drug ketamine, which has some catechol-like properties, if this guy's maxed out, there is no way that that, uh, uh, that little bit of uh, uh, effect is going to mitigate uh, what's going to happen to the rest of his physiology. So we modulate the dose. Okay? That's a critical concept. So this chart is from uh, an animal study. Um, on the uh, x-axis here, you see some uh, agents. And let's just focus on propofol uh, for the purpose of this discussion. This is the percent reduction in the, the standard dose that you can make uh, when the, uh, um, the subject is in shock uh, and get the same effect. So with respect to the propofol, you can reduce the dose by up to 90% and still get the same effect but create a drastically different uh, margin of safety. So regardless on the agent, modulate the dose. Use a reduced dose in a shock state. But don't confuse that with the paralytic. Right? So keep the sedative low and the paralytic high. This is a study where in animals they created a situation where there was a high flow state and a low flow state. And you can see that compared to placebo, the onset time of rocuronium is 52 seconds versus 114 seconds. So when you have some low flow state, right, when you have some low flow state, sedative low, paralytic high. Okay? Cool? All right. All right, so let's talk about oxygen. Okay, this is that second, uh, that second letter from the hot killers. Right? This one I get fired up about because this one is where you can make the biggest difference. And this is where um, most patients, if they're going to fall somewhere on the spectrum of physiologic difficulty, are going to have uh, some um, are going to have some uh, uh, some issue. Okay, so if we come together and we decide to make uh, a change in how we practice in this particular uh, uh, in this particular topic, uh, we're going to make a, a great change for our patients. Okay, why is this so important? Obviously, when we do emergency airway management on folks, let's say it's in the context of an RSI, we're going to create a situation where they may desaturate. 
they desaturate past 70, they're going to have all kinds of complications. Tons of references there, and we know, uh, uh, and we just know that from experience. What makes this scary is, is that as soon as you start to fall, you're going to fall fast, right? Everybody in the room has seen that. Okay, so a patient goes to get their emergency airway management done wherever the setting, and like life is good, life is good, SATs are 100, SATs are 99, life is good, but then all of a sudden the SATs start to fall and they're 70 before you know it. Everybody's had some experience like that, right? Okay. What makes this even scarier is the concept of pulse ox lag. Okay. So what you're actually seeing on the pulse oximeter is probably not what's actually going on at the capillary bed real time. It's probably 10 to 20 seconds delayed. So when you couple that with the fact that when they start to fall, they're going to fall fast, and you're probably behind on your monitoring, we got to have some tools to mitigate that because that's scary. Okay? I don't mean to scare anyone, but we got to realize that physiologic difficulty is real. Okay? So let's talk about some tools. The first tool is positioning. Simple thing that you can do. Sit, sit the patient at 25 degrees, semi-fowlers, and put their um, ear in line with their sternal notch. Okay, so sniffing position is not so much like this. The sniffing position is much more like this, with the ear hole in the uh, same plane as the, uh, the sternal notch. This will not only make your laryngoscopy easier, this will for sure for sure, make it easier and more effective uh, 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 for you to pre-oxygenate the patient. All right, now let's talk about pre-oxygenation, but with an asterisk. And the asterisk is because obviously when we pre-oxygenate people, we're not just pre-oxygenating them, but we're denitrogenating their FRC as well, which is really where the margin of safety comes from. Okay. All right. So um, this is my colleague, Drew. Drew's the Associate Medical Director of the MedFright Program, so he uh, uh, was very kind to be my model. Um, so uh, uh, thank you, Drew. So non-rebreather masks, or reservoir face masks, as um, um, some of authors like to call them, may not be sufficient. They only create probably 60 to 70% FiO2. That's not something that uh, I need to tell this audience. Um, lots of references to that effect. When you compare different pre-oxygenation strategies and you focus specifically on the non-rebreather mask, the FeO2, okay, so uh, the, the expired oxygen, is really only about 50%, um, i.e. you're not denitrogenating people when you're using a standard uh, non-rebreather mask. But what if we use flush rate oxygen in combination? So flush rate oxygen is a concept where um, you take a flow regulator, okay, so everybody's familiar obviously with these plugs uh, in the wall, um, and everyone's familiar with these devices uh, um, that uh, uh, hook up to the Christmas tree and, uh, uh, and you modulate flow. If you cap them out at 15 or 10, that's probably standard teaching for a bag mask device or a uh, non rebreather right? Okay. What you can do is actually, and I don't know, you can actually see it on this one, but you can create a situation where you have 40 liters to 60 liters a minute actually coming out of the, uh, the tree at the bottom um, by cranking it all the way, okay? So the first kind of like practical thing for us to talk about here is crank the thing up all the way, okay, till the, the ball at the top is going like this. Everybody's had some experience with seeing the ball at the top go, okay? So, so don't do laryngoscopy on anybody um, uh, without seeing that ball go like this, okay? This is the reason why. As soon as you go to flush rate, the FeO2 changes drastically uh, to about the 85, 90 range as opposed to that uh, 50 to 55 range, okay? That is going to create safe apnea time for your patients. This is a very similar trial from similar authors um, comparing that uh, non-rebreather at flush rate uh, to a bag mask at flush rate. Okay. All right. So now let's talk about a very common uh, situation, one that we're all familiar with again. Let's say that we've tried our best to pre-oxygenate the patient with standard measures and their oxygen saturations are 92, 93, 94. Okay. Super common situation everyone in this room has had, right? Well, what do we do now? What's our tool? 
Well, our tool is to now increase the mean airway pressure. Okay? Increase the mean airway pressure, just like if they were on a ventilator. Okay? The, uh, the best trial um, on this particular subject is by um, uh, these uh, 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 French authors, I believe, where uh, a standard group was compared to non-invasive ventilation before uh, advanced airway management. So in the standard group, just think uh, standard nasal cannula, standard uh, non-rebreather mask, um, uh, and then laryngoscopy. And then in the, um, uh, the experimental group, think exactly that, oh, we're not doing the best that we can. All of that comes off, non-invasive goes on, and then airway management happens. Okay? This is the most important line at the top. So patients who had SpO2 less than 80% in the control group, 12, in the non-invasive group, 2. I don't, I don't know what, uh, uh, what else to say than that. Okay. All right. So this is, uh, this is what I think is the, uh, the most useful part of the talk. Okay. So uh, I'm a med flight doc. Um, uh, I... Uh, uh, consider that my uh, my main uh, practice environment. So my my clinic is usually the cornfield. Um, the uh, um, and I love that because I like to get my hands dirty. So let's talk about how we get our hands dirty and we uh, affect a lot of these concepts that we are uh, uh, talking about. Okay. So here's Drew uh, and one of our residents. This is Eric. Uh, we uh, we're up in the hangar uh, and we're creating an experimental uh, situation. Okay. So here's Drew uh, and uh, he has a, a non rebreather mask on. He's being pre-oxygenated in, uh, in standard fashion. Okay? Let's say we've decided um, that we want to uh, put a nasal cannula on underneath to facilitate apneic oxygenation during the procedure. We'll, uh, we'll get back to that uh, if we have time at the end. Okay? And then we're going to put that nasal cannula back on. Okay? So this is a pretty standard uh, pre-oxygenation strategy here. Okay, so let's say our patient has taken a turn for the worse, they've gotten more altered, um, they can't protect their airway, they've uh, vomited a few times, uh, or let's say that uh, they've uh, had uh, respiratory, re respiratory failure for some other reason. This is pretty standard, right? right? Pretty standard. We see this all the time. All right. Let's say that we want to start applying some of the concepts that we've been talking about. So the first thing is just take one of those tanks and crank it up to flush rate. And then take the second tank crank it up to flush rate. You're going to affect the change in that FeO2 from like 50% to as high up as uh, 80 or 90%. That's a margin of safety. So this is great. This requires no funding. This requires no meetings to get equipment. This is great, right? You can do this today. You can do this today. Let's say that that strategy didn't get Drew up past 93, 94. Uh, and I'm stingy. Like, I insist that the patients are at 100. So let's say Drew's at 96, 97. Let's be stingy and let's try to, uh, let's try to get uh, uh, Drew up higher on his uh, pre-ox, higher on his uh, uh, denitrogenation. So you can see Eric has gotten out a bag mask device. Okay? He's gotten out a bag mask device. What's critical to do if you're going to use a bag mask for pre-oxygenation is, is that you add a peak valve. Okay? So for the residents in the room, um, most, bags, most bags have some port that looks like this. Okay? So this device right here, the peak valve, doesn't usually come on the bag. Right? Um, so the native bag will have some uh, exterior ring that looks like this. The reason that that's there is so that as the patient is exhaling, that, uh, uh, that gas has some place to go. The problem is that if you're going to use the bag to pre-oxygenate a patient, is that if they're spontaneously breathing with the mask on their face, that they're actually going to be breathing in room air through the exhalation port unless you cover it with something. Okay, So that's a critical concept. So if you're going to use this for pre-oxygenation, add a peep valve. And the beautiful thing about the peep valve is, is that it will create a situation where you uh, uh, can deliver peep to the patient. Okay. So here's our bag with our peep valve with an uh, appropriately sized face mask. 
that we're going to uh, use to um, pre-oxygenate our patient. What I like to teach is something called the TE grip, the thenar eminence grip. So instead of the classic way of gripping the bag that we're often taught like this, or, or double, double like this, try to grab it like this. Okay? And there you can see uh, uh, another representation. So you may remember the movie Alien where that thing kind of comes out at somebody's face, right? Um, every time you go to bag somebody you know, in the future, I want you to think of the movie Alien, right? And I want you to fly out at somebody's face uh, like, you're the, uh, like you're the creature in Alien. And the reason why is this. So if you are going to mask ventilate someone, you must underline, must create a patent airway. Okay, we all know this. The most effective way to do this is with the large muscles of your hand as opposed to the small muscles of your hand. So you don't want to be using your pinky finger to hold a jaw thrust on a large adult uh, or even a small adult, okay? Um, because they just, man, they, they fatigue. So use your large muscles, okay? So here's a, a great photo of our resident Eric doing some jaw thrust on Drew and you can actually see he's getting a little white knuckled. Like, this is motivating. Like, this fires me up. Like, I love it. Okay? Um, so, this is how you use a bag to pre oxygenate somebody. Okay? So, with a peep valve, with a patent airway, with a great mask seal. Okay. All right, fantastic. I'm so pumped that that works. Okay. The reason this is the most important slide in the talk is, is again, if you have a patient who's SATs a 90, 91, 92 on their non-rebreather, and that's the best you were able to do, let's say you're in Reedsburg, let's say you're a resident today and you're going to go work in the community in Reedsburg, Adams, um, Darlington, uh, Dodgeville. Your ability to get a non-invasive positive pressure machine in whatever, uh, uh, whatever form it comes to the bedside Maybe nil, okay? Maybe there's no RT in the whole hospital. Um, maybe the one machine you have is broken. This is a way that you can provide non-invasive positive pressure to these patients to create a margin of safety with stuff you have at the bedside in every single hospital uh, uh, in Wisconsin, okay? So two hands involved, face mask involved, peep valve involved, and another operator who's actually available to squeeze the back, okay? Um, if the patient is spontaneously breathing, they will breathe through the system fine. You do not need to be squeezing the back. And you should argue, actually, that you probably just let the patient spontaneously breathe so you don't run the risk of insufflating the stomach, okay? okay. Cool. I see lots of head knots, which is awesome. All right. Should we be squeezing the back? Okay. Should we be squeezing the back? It hinges on whether or not the patient's actually spontaneously ventilating or not. Well, how do we know that? It's clinically hard sometimes to adequately gauge is, okay, are your respirations favorable or unfavorable? Present or absent is pretty easy, right? But favorable or unfavorable isn't. So add inline and tidal CO2. You're very likely going to put that onto your endotracheal tube after you've uh, uh, placed it in the patient. So just whip it out now so you can monitor the quality of the respirations. The patients can't look like this. The patients can't look like this. Bad mask seal, bad positioning. Um, I put this slide in not so much to reference um, what you shouldn't do, but oftentimes, at least in the emergency department, if somebody's on non-invasive, and let's say uh, they've just been brought in by EMS, the dust is being settled, you've got some super sick trauma next door, um, you've got some uh, other person yelling, the, there's a lot of chaos. Patients on non-invasive positive pressure, whether it's a, a bi-level machine or a CPAP machine, oftentimes look like this. And sometimes we're like, hmm, they're failing the BiPAP or failing the CPAP or failing the bi-level. You have to apply the exact same concepts as you do here 
to really make it effective, especially if you're going to use it as a pre-oxygenation and denitrogenation strategy. Okay. So let's talk about apneic oxygenation. This is another tool that you can use to create a margin of safety during laryngoscopy. Okay. It works. Um, apneic oxygenation is simply the concept of providing oxygen flow to a patient without ventilations during the laryngoscopy. It's usually done by putting an, a simple nasal cannula on the patient underneath whatever you're using to actually pre-oxygenate them, and then you just leave it on while you're doing the laryngoscopy. It works. This is a study from the late 50s where uh, subjects in the operating room uh, were left apneic for a long period of time, and you can see that their SATs don't change, in theory, with informed consent. Um, so it works, it works, okay? Uh, tons of evidence to that effect from, uh, the, uh, uh, from the operating room. The problem is, is that when this is tested in emergency settings, um, the same benefit isn't necessarily seen. Um, so this is a study uh, from emergency medicine uh, that was relatively equivocal to this effect, okay? The reason why, unequivocally, is, is that if you don't have a patent airway, that's not going to work. And if you don't have um, uh, the ability to oxygenate the patient without PEEP, that's not going to work. Okay? So my hypothesis is, is that if you didn't need PEEP to pre-oxygenate the patient and you can maintain a patent airway during the apneic phase, it's going to work. And if you can't, it won't. Thrive is the concept of using high-flow nasal cannula for this purpose. I can never remember what this, uh, this acronym actually stands for. This is a, a, a European-derived uh, acronym. But it's the concept of using um, high-flow nasal cannula. So, for instance, the OptiFlow machine uh, for this particular purpose. There's mixed evidence uh, from uh, uh, critical care, some that it works, some that it doesn't. DSI is another tool that you can use um, to uh, create a margin of safety. Um, DSI is the concept, as compared to RSI, of instead of rapidly giving uh, uh, neuro, or excuse me, um, sedative agent followed by neuromuscular blocking agent uh, followed by some time period X and then passing the tube, it's the concept of sedative agent, pause, chill out, paralytic agent, Pass the tube. And the reason why one might employ this strategy is let's say that the patient is super combative from hypercarbia, or let's say that the patient is super combative from booze. If we sedate them safely okay, and then pre oxygenate them like we couldn't do before, then maybe we've created a margin of safety. It works, it works for sure. Um, in a growing uh, uh, body of evidence in hypoxic patients who fit that particular profile, it gets you from a state of hypoxia to a state of normoxia before your laryngoscopy happens. The problem is, is we don't have a ton of safety data, i.e. outcome data yet. Okay? So if you don't uh, buy into this yet, that's fair. That's totally fair. But it works, at least in concept. And then the last thing that you can do is you can bag the patient through their apneic phase. That's another tool. So at least in RSI, we've taught for years and years and years not to do that. But the reason that it's been a problem for years and years and years is that we haven't appropriately taught people to make sure that they keep their pressures low. Probably 20 centimeters of water pressure is what's going to overcome the LES. So as long as you're doing that, as long as you're doing that, you're probably doing OK ventilating the patient with the back. Okay. And then extraglottic devices are uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, a tool that can be used as well. Okay. Um, this is a, uh, um, uh, this is a very simply a, uh, a, a plan, for lack of a better term, um, that we've established with some of our, uh, our colleagues in respiratory therapy in the emergency department at least um, to use non-invasive positive pressure and high flow nasal cannula for the purposes of uh, apneic oxygenation. So 
Um, if uh, in the emergency department, at least, uh, this is something that you're confronted with, um, our RT colleagues are um, uh, uh, on the same page. Okay. And then there's pH. This is the last hop, okay. pH. Intubating this person is super dangerous, okay. This is pH. Intubating this person is super dangerous. We all know this. We've done this. The only thing to note is that, the only thing to note there is that whatever you do, the only tool that you have is, is that you have to keep the person breathing because what's keeping them alive is their own respiratory compensation. So whatever plan you make, doesn't matter. Just make sure that that plan involves a lack of apnea. Right? All right, this is my last slide. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, it's uh, pride. So I think that we spent a ton of time, uh, and I'm an expert in the gizmos. My academic interest is uh, extraglottic devices, so uh, kings, combi tubes, uh, LMAs, and all the derivatives. That's my academic interest. Um, I love the gizmos. I love the gadgets. I love video laryngoscopes. Um, I, uh, I, I think they're fantastic and fun to think about. We spent too much time on the gizmos and the gadgets. And we spent way too much time, like way too much time, talking about operator A doing X, Y, or Z, or an operator B doing X, Y, or Z. And, okay, you use this uh, device, you use that device. We're missing the boat, friends. Like, like this is just uh, the wrong conversation to have. The margin of safety is in, uh, is in doing things to specifically affect the hop killers. Okay? And the reason that I think it's so critical to recognize that is that it's, it's simple stuff. It's not stuff that requires fancy new gadgets or gizmos or money or people. It's very simply a, uh, uh, it's very simply a realization that we need to affect change in this particular regard. So um, that's why I put uh, pride up on the screen, is I think that the way that we maybe take the next step uh, in um, the safety profile of these procedures is that we just as a group take a ton of pride in making sure to keep the hop killers from killing our patients. So, uh, and I think that it's tangible and doable and pragmatic, so it's not necessarily like an esoteric thing. That's why I think it's so important. So. Um, it's been my honor and pleasure to be here. Um, I'm more than willing to take as many questions as you like. Um, uh, thank you so much again for the invitation. Cheers. <clears throat>Uh, yes, sir. Fantastic question. question. Oh, um, yeah. uh, so um, the question was, uh, and this is such a great question. Um, so the question is, is, do we use the bougie introducer routinely uh, when we intubate patients, um, most specifically uh, with respect to recent evidence? So uh, my answer is uh, yes, uh, but with an asterisk, because everybody's got their own practice pattern. Um, do I? Absolutely. Absolutely, but let me uh, let me opine for just a second on that. So um, the trial, and it's from those same authors that uh, did the flush rate oxygen uh, stuff. Uh, the the trial was um, so everybody who came into um, the trauma bay at Hennepin, and they actually film um, everything that goes on there, and they have a ton of research enrollers um, that are present for essentially all of their critical patients in the emergency department. What happens? Um, or at least what happened as part of this trial, which was in JAMA, I think, six months ago, um, is, is they randomized patients to either getting standard care, which was to take a, uh, a CMAC device. Okay, so a CMAC is a standard geometry video laryngoscope, or at least um, uh, the CMAC, the version of the CMAC device that they were using. So think of a MAC-4, okay, MAC-4, but with a video camera on it. So, when you do laryngoscopy with a device that looks like that, okay, when you do laryngoscopy with a device that looks like that, you do exactly the same thing with your arm that you do with an old school Mac, 
You do exactly the same thing that you would do for two passage as you would with an old school Mac, but you have the option of looking at the camera with your eyes or looking uh, in the mouth directly. So you can do DL or what I like to call standard geometry VL with this device. Okay? So what these authors did is they did a trial using this device with the standard geometry video laryngoscopy technique where they either passed um, a styleted endotracheal tube or they, uh, they placed a bougie um, and then an RT would take the endotracheal tube, load it onto the bougie after it was in the trachea, and then uh, the operator then grabs the tube and railroads it in. Okay? So they showed that it was much more favorable, um, statistically significant, um, to use the bougie as compared to um, kind of what we would consider standard practice. Okay? Um, the only caveat to that, the only caveat to that, and the author is a good friend of mine, is, is that they use the bougie a lot at Hennepin, okay, before the trial. And I'll tell you from personal experience and from teaching at some national courses that the bougie is simple for an operator to place. But actually getting to the point from placed into the trachea to tube in the trachea is more of a function of the system, i.e. the other people in the room, um, having some situational awareness of like what you expect to happen next. So I think that if you're going to make the plan to use the bougie um, on all of your tubes, you just very simply need to make sure that everybody in the room knows what step A through step Z is, and then you can expect to see similar results from that trial. Um, I think the bougie introducer is a fantastic device. It makes a ton of sense to use. The only caveat there is, is that, uh, at least in this institution, the, uh, the video laryngoscope uh, of choice is the GlideScope device, or I, I guess I, I'm, I'm in the VA. At the, um, uh, at the UW hospital, at least in my experience, this isn't scientific, as the GlideScope device tends to be used. Um, or in the emergency department, the CMAC device tends to be used. But the version of the CMAC device that's used is the, uh, the hyperangulated uh, CMAC device. The Bougie introducer is a linear introducer. Um, it's a, um, uh, for the residents in the room, it's the, the, the long blue thing that's 70 centimeters. Uh, unless you're creating a straight line from the outside to the inside, that device isn't going to be advantageous. So um, there is disagreement with respect to how advantageous it is with uh, 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 using the GlideScope device and hyperangulated VL when you do a few things to it. But you just have to be uh, clear that you're not translating data from Brian's study uh, to uh, uh, the glide scope, if that makes sense. Did I, did I fully answer your question, sir? Perfect. Further questions? Was there one in the back? Yes. How long did those uh, uh, oxygen masks last in the field? Since we know a high flow, we probably got to run pretty quick for that. Super, super quick. That's a great question. Thank you, sir. Um, the, uh, a D cylinder, which one of those is, F flush, I don't know, what do you think, guys? 10 minutes, if that, five minutes, something like that. Yeah, the, the beautiful thing for us, unlike our colleagues in Europe, is that uh, um, we have the ability um, here in the United States usually to take critically ill or injured patients from the field and put them into ambulances. Um, and the reason why our colleagues in Europe and in Australia can't do that is that their ambulances are super tiny. So um, we have huge ambulances here in the United States. So when we take our patients and put them in the ambulance, we can use the ambulance's oxygen, which almost never runs out. But thank you for the question, sir. Uh, other questions? With that, thank you very Great. much. No, thank you, friends. Seriously, please.